15, and this over here is also 15. Okay? So that geometry right there allows you to figure out the current stretch of the spring. Imagine that this is now going to be our LBC. And our LBC, the whole length of the spring, is going to be one of these legs times two. So it should be a two times basically a cosine 15 of a 0.4. So 0.4 cosine 15. So that gives me that gives me the stretch length at position one. And then you're told you need to find something kinematic about the system when it goes back to the relaxed position. So you've got to figure out what that position is. 0.4 between C and A, 0.4 on the slender rod, 0.4 when the spring is unstretched. So guess what happens? It turns into an equilateral triangle. Okay, so we're gonna ex you're going to expect, uh, even just from that information alone, you can deduce that your position must be like this. That. All right, so there you have it. Our equilibrium position, when the spring is relaxed again, happens to be an equilateral triangle. Therefore, it means that we've got two positions, one and two. We're going to need energy at some point. You ask yourself, is there any non-conservative force that is, you know, requires you to use principle of work and energy? No, we've said nothing about friction. There's no, there's no friction anywhere. It's just the spring and some gravity. Um, and so the idea is this is a conservation of energy problem. That's what it boils down to. And now we're just going to go T1, V1, T2, V2. So pretty, pretty basic stuff. And so everything is initially static or at rest. And I'll give you all of the things that are currently at position one, we've got potential energy of the rod at time one VAB1. So this is going to be MAB, G, HAB at one. And recognizing that if I use my datum as the ground, then G is just going to be half that length and a, and a sine 30. So it should be an M A B G L A B divided by two sine thirty. And I'll give you the number for that, twenty five point twenty four point five three joules. And then what else do we have? We obviously have the potential energy of the spring. And so we can do this easily one half K. And you just got to make sure that you subtract its uh, unstretched length. So this will be LCB minus L naught all squared. 34.73. All right, the so rest of this is pretty, pretty easy. Okay, And the final piece of the puzzle, final piece of the puzzle is clearly the rotational energy of the slender rod. Right? The spring, we're assuming, is, is negligible mass. We're not worried about it. All it does is have spring energy. The only thing that has mass and has other inertia, the rotational inertia, is the slender rod. So we just got to make sure that we know what our T2 is. Our T2 is going to be, again, 1 half i. And easiest thing to do, do it at the fixed point which in this case is our point A, like that, all right? So that covers your bases. It'll do everything that you need because that's a fixed point of rotation. And this IA here is clearly end of a slender rod, so one-third ml squared. 
So let me do it this way. It'll be equal to IA is equal to 1 third MAB LAB squared. That's a 1.33. One point three three kilogram meters squared, and now you've got all the pieces to just solve for omega a b. Okay, so back to conservation of energy equation. So it becomes. 24.53 plus my 34.73 is equal to 42.48 plus 1 half 1.33 omega AB squared. That's it. Just kind of a bit of a warm up problem for you. Wrap up the section. Yeah. What's that? The work done by the spring. Question is where did we account for the work done by the spring? So what, what happened when we, when we did our T1V1, T2, V2 back in our our particle kinematics, right? What happened was that the spring got broken up into the V1 and the V2, right? So what, I, what, you, what you see there is my Vs1 and my Vs2 is accounting for the combined work of the spring. Yeah. So you can go back and check, right? The, the idea is a spring has a force. It's going to be k times stretch. And then that ks, if you put it in the integral, what happens to the equation? It becomes 1 half ks squared, right? So we've already taken that into account. It would have been lumped together as how much work was being done from 1 to 2, but we took them and separated it into you know, position 1 and position 2. OK? Yeah? How do we know that the spring does not compress when it goes to its second position? Because we gave it to you that the L naught, the unstretched length, was, was 0.4. So at that point, right, when, when, when the, when the, based on the wording of the problem, right, I told you that unstretched length of the spring was 0.4 meters. And then I asked you for omega AB when it went back to its unstretched position. Right? Then basically, it has to have no more, no more potential energy. OK, is that, is that clear? OK, on to chapter 19. So we've done our, our work in energy bit. So our next piece to the puzzle, as always, is momentum and impulse. Right? So everything that you've learned previously, again, follows. And it just comes down to our ability to expand it to 2D rigid bodies. So here's our chapter 19, momentum. Impulse for 2D rigid bodies. So here's how, how easy it is. I'm going to jump straight into 19.2. And let's just go right into the principle of momentum and impulse and revisit it, the ones that we did for a particle, and see what happens when you have rigid bodies. So the first thing to note, we're back to Whereas energy is a scalar equation, everything in joules and energy, scalars 
We're back to dealing with vectors when we deal with momentum and impulse. And what we first have to deal with is the idea of linear momentum and impulse. And we should now be familiar with the following, right? M V1 is the initial momentum of a particle or a system of particles, but it is now in this case the linear momentum of the rigid body. So it's not good enough just to say V1 anymore. If we're dealing with linear momentum, we need to make sure that we focus on a very special point, which is center of mass. So I just add a subscript and I say I'm going to look very carefully at mv and the v being through center of mass g. Everything else follows. You're going to do a t1 to t2 integral of all of the impulses that are caused by external forces. So we're going to take a sum of all the f's. We're going to multiply it by a dt and integrate from t1 to t2. And then we're going to make that equal to m vg over 2. Okay. So pretty simple. And the reason why we go through g is exactly the same reason why in chapter 17, when I first introduced our equations of motion, it's exactly the same reason why sum of f is equal to mag, the acceleration at point g. That is the exact same reason why we need that. Okay. But clearly, we're not only going to deal with linear momentum. Rigid bodies have the ability to rotate. So when we rotate, we must deal with the rigid body's angular momentum. So guess what? If your equations of motion have sum of f is ma, we also must have sum of moments must be equal to i alpha. And the momentum and impulse version of that is just like the following. It's h. And I'm going to start by writing this in vector form. So it's typically it's our HO vector. So this is our angular momentum that's basically the, the analogous to our linear momentum. And I'm going to say this is at time 1. And this is going to be equal to integral t1 to t2 of the sum of all the moments about O. Right? And this is going to be equal to h o 2. OK? That, that is pretty much it right there. If you, if you can understand these two equations and be able to break them up, you're, you're, you're going to be you're going to be sailing through this particular part of the course. Okay, now I've written it as h o and I've put vectors on them, but clearly we are dealing with you know, 2D only in this course. All right? And I want to make a point of uh, substituting our h's with what we know to be the equation now for the mass moment of inertia. So previously in the particle section, I didn't really reveal this, but through some of the derivations, I actually did show you early on that this HO equal to obviously our, you know, HO is equal to our RO cross MV, right? MV of O, MV of P with respect to O, right? But the bottom line was after all my derivations, I actually proved to you that in 2D, this angular momentum value must be equal to I O times omega. Right? Oops. Okay, and that must, must make sense to you because just like in linear momentum, let me remind you again the equation was let's do all the sum of the moments. It just basically means it must be the time rate of change of angular momentum dHO by dt. And if you now take the derivative of my angular momentum like this, IO is constant and it gives you IO alpha, right? So everything fits together. This IO alpha, as it's connected to the sum of moments around point O, is, is basically due to this idea here. The angular momentum is IO times omega. So all of that is linked together. And so now I can rewrite my angular momentum like the following IO 
omega 1 plus integral t1, t2, sum of moments about O is I O omega 2. Okay? And then I extend it to one more thing. Remember that O's are only great if you happen to have a fixed point O. In other cases where you've got general plane motion, what point is more reliable than O if you have general plane motion? Center of mass G. So if you focus on the center of mass G, and you calculate an IG, you're guaranteed to get the right answer. Sum of moments about G is equal to IG omega 2. That's it. Oops. OK, any questions on that? Basically just took everything that we've discussed and I just expanded it and put it under the umbrella of chapter 19 so that it all fits in one spot. OK, and I'll give you one extra note, right? So when asked for calculations of linear or angular momentum, OK? So when, you're, when we're asking you, just give us linear momentum at this particular time in this particular position. We're really just saying, don't even bother with this whole principle business, principle of momentum and impulse. We just want you that at that one instantaneous moment in time, give us this calculation. Just do a, just do a, a, a capital L to indicate linear momentum and do an MV. Like that's really all we're asking for. And in fact, for rigid bodies, VG, right? L is equal to MVG. And we could ask you for angular momentum. So we'll say very, very specifically, right? We'll say, Give us the angular momentum about point whatever. So we say give us angular momentum about point O. We are really saying calculate for us I O omega at that particular instant in time. Whatever omega is and whatever your I O is, just give us that. right? And it doesn't matter if it's H O or H G. It's the same equation, right? O's and G's are the points that matter. Yeah. Difference between O and G. So O is uh, the, the letter that I like to use when there happens to be a fixed point of rotation. And O is that fixed point of rotation. And because it's fixed, then that means O itself does not have a velocity. And if that's the case, then this equation applies. It can't, it can't have a velocity and it can't have an acceleration. Okay? G works because it happens to be the center of mass. And because it's got the center of mass, or it, it is the center of mass, um, then, then you don't have moments created by things like the acceleration through the center of mass. Okay? It doesn't have a moment there. OK? And I'll give you even one more. If you happen to land on this, if you happen to know instantaneous center of zero velocity, for that one instant in time, guess what? That's a very useful thing as well. OK. So that's it, right? And I've got conservation of momentum that I also have to cover. But for the most part, if this is our framework for principle of linear mo uh, for momentum and impulse, both linear and angular, then all we need to do is just do some examples here to 
to hammer home the point. So let's start, let's start simple and work our way, work our way up. Okay, so first example, I'm going to give you one of these flywheels again. Fixed point O to make it easy. And I'm going to say that the flywheel initially has an omega i. And I'm going to apply a moment. And this moment is a capital M. It's a braking moment, OK? So it's basically applied, like you slammed on the brakes on it. And it's going to serve as a coupled moment to slow this flywheel down. So this is flywheel rotating at omega i, 180 RPM initially. Brakes are applied. Flywheel stops after 12.8 minutes. Okay? Find M break. Okay? So, guess what? Absolutely solvable if you absolutely need to do it. You can totally do that, right? You can do that because that, you can get that answer without fail if you use this, OK? But what happens after you solve for this angular acceleration? Well, then you got another step, right? Angular acceleration is going to be constant. Then you're going to be forced to link this to this. So there's a connection between these two, and then that gives you your angular velocity from the beginning and at the end. But why bother with all of that if you happen to have the principle of momentum and impulse, right? All you need to do is set it up so that you have IO omega 1 is equal to IO omega 2, not forgetting that all you need to do is integrate all of the moments that are being applied. There's only one moment here. And that's our M break. Yeah. So are we given like enough like conditions to solve the problem? Question is, are we given enough conditions to solve the problem? Do you see anything that's missing right now? Like how do we get M O if we don't have the thing? Oh, because I haven't given you because I haven't given you enough stuff, right? Mass of the flywheel. I'll give you, it's a flywheel, so I need radius of gyration, kg. That would help, right? Sorry about that. So that means our IO is mkg squared. And let me just write everything out in symbols. What we have is mokg squared omega 1. And then it's going to be minus my m break, which is constant, times a delta t. And it's going to stop. So it's going to be 0. That's it. m break, m o k, oops, m k g squared omega 1 over delta t. OK, so that's a pretty, pretty easy one. 89.3 Newton meters is the answer to that, is that problem.
Okay, and as drawn in the diagram. So it was initially rotating clockwise, and then the brake was being applied in this direction. Okay, nice and easy. And then let's do another one. Any, any questions on that one? Yeah. Delta t to seconds, yeah, of course. So you take your RPM and you do this. Okay? It's built into the answer. Okay, anything else? All right, so let's do a bigger problem. Okay, probably seen too many of these already. Is really, are you guys doing your latest homework assignments yet? Is it on momentum and impulse? Does it have a problem that looks like this? Sort of, no? Probably something like this, right? Okay, hopefully this helps. Okay, so this is a drum. Okay, so we have a drum that's not exactly like a, a regular cylinder, so I have to give you both the, diameter, uh, the radius as well as the radius of gyration k0. And all these other parameters, there's friction involved. So it's released from rest, and it starts rolling down the incline. Find omega at t is equal to two seconds. Okay? So recap, right? Like, like everything that I've said about all three of these sections, I've always said if you have, if you need to find forces, accelerations, you go to f is equal to ma. If it's velocities, displacements, then you do energy and work. And if it's velocities and times, you do momentum and impulse. So textbook case here, we need angular velocity and we have a time. Shows you that we probably need to do momentum and impulse. It's released from rest. I haven't told you anything about the friction case yet, but I've given you both coefficients of friction. First order of business, free body diagram. mg down, pretty sure it's going to rotate that way. Fn goes through the contact point based on the angle theta, and then we've got friction. Okay? So we know what happens, right? You have to assume a direction of friction. You even have to assume whether it's rolling without slip or not without slip. You're going to have to make some initial guesses and then support your answer at the very end. And all of that is, is borne out by the end when you get the answer. You have to make sure that your friction is positive. If you're going to guess in the right direction, you've got to make sure that your static friction is 
uh, is actually less than the maximum possible, et cetera, right? But we know for sure that's a free body diagram, and I'm going to go with my yx in that way right there. OK, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do assume rolling without slip. Right? It's always our, our practice. If we do that, looks to me like I'm going to need, let's do the following here. Uh, let's do linear momentum. OK, like I said, pretty good guess to do linear momentum at this point. It's going to be the following, right? M vg1 in the x direction. Right? So focus on the x direction right now, because it doesn't move in the y. So x is going to give you more information. It starts from rest, so that's 0. I'm going to add to that all of my t1, t2 sum of forces in the x. Dt. And I'm going to make this equal to my mvg2x. OK? Got to figure out what my sum of forces in the x is. You look on the free body diagram. Looks to me like this must be the following here. A component of the mg minus ff. Okay. And then it's equal to my mvg2 in the x direction. Do we know anything else about this VG2? It's through the center of the drum. It's rolling without slip is the assumption. Okay, It's going to go down that way. So all of the velocity is in the x direction, the way that I've angled it down the incline. What's that? Omega r. Exactly. Omega 2r. Right? Because we're assuming rolling without slip, right? And we like it because accelerations are alpha r's and velocities are omega r's. So we're going to do that, but we have to go back and check later. Right? So that's pretty good. It gives us an equation, and it so far looks to me like this is not time dependent, so I can take that as a constant. It's going to be multiplied to delta t. Omega 2 is, our, is the answer that we're looking for, but we're still missing our friction force. We still got one unknown. So it looks to me like we need another equation. Let's go to angular momentum. Angular momentum looks like this. I, and now we got a choice. What point do we pick for this angular momentum? We could do G, we could go O. O happens to be our, our what? Our instantaneous center of zero velocity, right? And it means that we actually end up with just mg through um, giving a moment about, oh, but on the other hand, we're missing FF, right? We're mixing, missing friction force. And so it would be really, really nice if I had friction force in here to give me that second equation. So I'm going to do this. Ig omega 1 is 0. And I'm going to add that to a sum of all of the moments, g, is equal to Ig omega 2. And what is giving me positive moments in my direction? It's going to be just FF. Everything else, the, the weight mg and, and, the, and the normal force, pass through the center of mass, no moments. So basically, this ends up being the following. Force of friction, the unknown, multiplied by r, radius of the drum, delta t, is equal to Ig omega 2. Okay, So it's this equation together with this equation, two equations, two unknowns. And you can now solve for ff and omega 2.
Okay, so I'll rewrite this. It looks to me like the following FF. I'm going to rearrange that equation over there. Be IO omega 2 R delta T. And IO is, now I'm going to use my, I'm going to use my radius of gyration, omega 2 R delta T. And we know all of this. And then so substituting, I'm going to get the following, mg sine 30 minus ff. So it would be minus 1.823 omega 2. Whole thing delta t is equal to m omega 2 r. So you're going to have to do some rearranging. Omega 2 is. Twenty-seven point nine radians per second. Okay. And VG, just give you the number here. VG, given that it is rolling without slip, must be omega two times R. So an eight point three six meter per second. That's your answer. Okay. Question. What's that? KG was given. Did I not give you guys KG? Oh, sorry. K. I called it K not in my first on the first blackboard. K not if it was missing is 125 millimeters. Hopefully, I gave that to you, right? Did I? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any any questions? We got one thing to do here, right? We got to double check that the rolling without slip condition was met. You must do this check. Absolutely critical. Rolling without slip. Okay? How do we do this check? We got to go back to our mu s, et cetera, right? So the FF that we calculated to be. 1.823 omega 2. This is what I call my FF actual. This is the actual static friction force that must make this problem all fit together and work. And if I plugged in my omega 2, I get 50.8 newtons. We now have to compare this to the maximum. FF static max. And that is equal to mu s fn. fn, on the other hand, if you did your force balance for y, your typical mg cosine 30 times mu s. Two thirty eight newtons. Final conclusion. FF actual less than F max. Therefore, rolling without slip. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Seems like all of the conclusions that I ever have is always just rolling without slip, right? So let's do a slightly different case. I'm going to do mu s is 0 0.04. OK? So notice, if you compare, if a mu s is 0 0.004 or 0 0.04, this is, you can almost argue that this is like 10 times more slippery, right? Right? 
It was previously 0.4. I'm going to make it 0.04. It's going to be much, much more slippery. And we can expect that maybe there's going to be some slip. So I'm going to recalculate this, FFS max 0.04 mg cosine 30. And you can expect it to be now 10 times smaller. OK? And there you have it, right? Condition fails, FF actual greater than F max slip. So what happens now? What happens now is actually even makes the problem even easier, if you can believe it, right? Why? Because now you go straight to dynamic friction. And in dynamic friction, there's no guessing, right? There's no inequality. We know immediately that it must be mu k fn or mu k mg cos 30. OK? So I, I made the surface 10 times more slippery with mu s. Let's assume that I do the same thing. Let's assume a new mu k of that, right? A new you know, for the new slippery surface, right? OK, so everything is 10 times more slippery. So I'm going to now calculate my FF dynamic. In fact, I'll just write FF for simplicity's sake. And it's going to be equal to 17.84 newtons. You draw your diagram again. Mg Fn FF. And when you reapply the equation, you don't even actually need two equations with two unknowns. Here's what it would look like. So it goes back to this, right? Ig omega 1 plus sum of the moments dt is equal to Ig omega 2. This is 0, right? But if you look at the moments, the same thing. It's just my, I should have just gone straight to this step, right? Fr delta t is Ig omega 2. This is now known. So this becomes FF r delta t. Ig is mk naught squared, like that. 9.79 radians per second. Right? The simplicity comes from the fact that you knew exactly what the friction force is. It's dynamic friction. There's no, there's no argument about it. It has to be mu k. One equation, you get to omega. But let's do one more check, right? If I ask you for vg, what do you think vg is going to be? You're going to try to do something like this, omega 2r, wrong, right? No longer applies, right? Cannot apply. Because condition is now slip. OK? Which means there has to be something else that you need to solve for VG. That involves now integrating other equations like your linear momentum, et cetera. But this is now how all those pieces fit together. And hopefully you see that. No longer can you make this assumption. It doesn't work because it slips. You don't need linear momentum now. You solve it right away because FF is no longer an unknown. It is known. Any other questions? No? One more. Is it just moving down how? Oh, OK. One, one last question, a really good one. So physically, what is going on? 
if the drum is rolling with slip, does it mean the whole thing is just translating and sliding down? No, actually it's not slide, it's not just translating. We proved that because omega 2 is not 0. So the thing is rotating, it's just rotating where that point that it's touching the incline is not the instantaneous center of zero velocity. It's actually like rotating and sliding at the same time. Okay? All right, perfect guys. Have a good weekend. See you on Monday.